Ray looks like he's not. Good morning. I met that 17-year-old and 15-year-old, but I don't remember them. <laughs> Today we're getting towards the end of the uh, sermon series, just this one and then uh, uh, conclusion sermon next week. And uh, you notice one changed word from all of the other sermons. Acquired. Our acquired thirst for the kingdom. You'll also notice that Rick read my notes and he's doing Matthew 7, 13 and 14 and we're doing the same thing. But we'll get to that. We have a couple parables to look at and some other verses that go alongside of this idea of an acquired thirst for the kingdom. Not everybody likes the same things, right? And tastes change over time. There are things that we no longer enjoy, and there are things that we did not like, but we have come to enjoy. There's four things on my list. Two of those are things that I had enjoyed in the past that I no longer enjoy, and two things that didn't enjoy that I do enjoy. You can guess which ones are which. I don't like ketchup. I don't, I don't like it on anything. I'll use it for a, a sauce or a soup, you know, something like that, but I don't like the taste of it. Now, Brussels sprouts, never like Brussels sprouts. But roasted Brussels sprouts or fried with some garlic butter, now that's, that's good stuff. Blue cheese, that's a good thing. Probably wasn't when I was little, but now that's a good thing. I like blue cheese. And pierogies? Used to like them? No. Either have pasta or potatoes. Why do you have to put them together? I don't get it. So the girls will eat pierogies, and I'll have something else. It's just the way it is. But you see, tastes change over time. That's not the way that it always was. What would be on your list? What have you lost a taste for? And what have you acquired a taste for? Well, we can connect to this concept physically, but we can also connect to it spiritually. Our physical taste changes over time, but so does our desire. We can acquire a desire, a thirst for something, a taste for something spiritually that we didn't in the past. We can acquire a taste for spiritual concepts and connections, coming to a point of preference of really enjoying them. And that's particularly true with today's topic. Living for Christ in the kingdom is an acquired taste. It's not one that most of us start with, but it is something that can be acquired. And it becomes so acquired that it's a preference. Today's discussion relates more to the sermon about thirsting for growth, because in that sermon, I was talking about what God desires for us. In a similar way, I see God wanting us to acquire a taste for the kingdom, to not be satisfied until we're filled by being a part of it and by being a part of the church and sharing that invitation with others. He wants us to come to that point. And so he gives us a little bit and we try it. And then we want a little more and then we want a little more. But he wants us to grow to that point. Today's topic also connects with the second sermon in the series about thirsting for, the, for purpose. In that sermon, I gave one passage that is the purpose of your life. What was that passage? It's in one of the Gospels. Starts with Matthew. Do you remember the one passage that I suggested? You keep this in mind and it'll help guide you. It is the purpose of your life. Matthew 25, 21. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. All of life is about living to come to that point. The purpose of life is to have Jesus say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in. Because what else is there in life but that? Or how about it this way? You live your life and get everything else, but you never hear those words. 
Was that a good life? What was your purpose of life then? That is, it reminds us of an in and out, of a with Christ or not with Christ. Kingdom living. Kingdom living is essential to hearing these words from Jesus. So we need to develop a thirst for the kingdom so that that is what we want to develop. That is where our connection is. That's what's most filling. That's what's most beneficial to us. Before we start with today's parables, I want to start with, if not a tough question, how about the tough question? If it came down to your connection to God as a servant of the kingdom at the loss of at the loss of everything else, how might you feel? Is it worth the trade? If it came down to that point in your life where it was, I can either have my connection with God, but I've got to give up everything else. No funds, no family, no fun. A life like Job, struggling, miserable, hurting, is it worth the exchange? If God said it's me and nothing else, would you still do it? Are you willing to give up your job, your family, your friends, your sports, your entertainment, your free time, and absolutely everything else to serve Christ in his kingdom? It's an all-in Jesus' first lifestyle. Are you willing to say, if it's not kingdom, I don't connect to it. Is that the tough question? This is Jesus' first lifestyle. Because that's an important question before we get into these parables. And we're going to come back to it. In Matthew 13, 44 through 46, the parables are short ones, one-liners. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought that field. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it, and then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought the field. The next one is like it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. These two parables focus on the value of the kingdom. Could a water bottle be more valuable than a diamond? If it says thirsty and you didn't know Jesus and then you come to know Jesus, is that worth it? Yeah, you're giving up the short term for the long term. It can be worth it because we put value on what we value. Anybody watch Survivor? Did you get to the food auction part? $500, $1,000 for a hamburger? Like why? Because that's what you need. That's what you want. That's worth everything in the game at that point. See, value is just what we put on it. It's what we agree it's worth. And sometimes you say, no, it's worth a lot more than that. They focus on the value of the kingdom. In each case, the person knew what they had found, and they sold everything they had to acquire the treasure, to acquire the pearl. He also got a field in the mix. But how valuable is the kingdom of heaven to you? Because he said the kingdom of heaven is like these things. What do we give up in light of eternity in the future to be part of the church today? How does it cost us today to be part of the kingdom? What do we say no to? What do we give up in order to connect to the work of God and to the church? How many congregations have shut the doors because people don't value what they have? Or they think it's good for somebody else. Or I'll have my own faith, but we don't need to do this together. 
They've lost a kingdom vision. How many people ignored the invitation to join us in the work of the kingdom because they don't appreciate the value? They just haven't acquired a thirst for the kingdom. How many people, when you talk to about spiritual matters, are just not interested because they, don't, they haven't acquired a taste for it? It's like feeding me blue cheese when I was two years old. That doesn't taste good. But wait, it will, but not right now, you know? So we're thankful. This can be judgmental, it can be critical, but it can also be thankful. We're thankful for those that show that our congregation is a priority. How do you show that it's a priority? You show it by sacrificing. Sacrifice our time, sacrifice our finances, sacrifice our focus. We pray for one another, we fellowship together, we encourage one another, all in the name of Christ and the kingdom. And that the kingdom is not just here. But wherever God is at work, we pray for that. We're encouraged by it. We're blessed by it. In these parables, the people sold everything they had, and that showed their commitment. It was full commitment. The treasure in the field and the pearl of great price reminds us also of the cost of the kingdom. It is not buying the treasure for as cheap as possible. The parable doesn't say he went and found the, found the treasure, buried it, went back and negotiated a price. Does it? He didn't say, I bought it for this much, but look at how much I kept on the side. He didn't find the pearl and say, what's the lowest price you'll take on this? He gave up everything for it. Everything for it. But in our culture... People seem to be want to be a part of the kingdom for the least cost possible. What's the minimum commitment? What can I do to just skate by? There's all these other options. What makes your option better than all the other options? Kingdom living is giving our all. Giving up everything, giving our all, and knowing that being part of the kingdom is worth much more and everything that we can give. It's giving our all and still feeling bad that you can't give enough, isn't it? It's giving back to Jesus everything and saying, that's all, that's all I got, will you take it? Because what you're offering me is way more important. It's way more valuable than anything and everything that I can give up. So I'll start with everything, and if there's more, I'll find a way. But I need to be a part of this. It's a blessing to be a part of the kingdom and we should be willing to sacrifice everything to be a part of what God is doing for eternity. At the end of the parable, the person has the treasure and nothing else. And they, what did they feel? Joy. They were pleased that they made the right exchange. They sold everything and just had the treasure. They were pleased with the exchange. So here's that tough question again. This time I've highlighted one word because it's an important word in the question. Why is that an important word? Are you willing? Here's why it's important to me. Because Jesus doesn't make me do it. Does he? Has he made you? He doesn't make you make this number one. He doesn't strip everything else out of life so that all you can focus on is the kingdom. But he does say, are you willing? Because if you're willing, let's make the exchange. And because he doesn't strip it away from us, we have to be willing to give it back to him. The only out in the question is the word willing because God wants you to put kingdom living absolutely first over everything else, but he wants you to acquire a taste for it. He doesn't make us. And here's the other part. 
He accepts us when we don't. Isn't that good news too? We can be partially kingdom living people and still make it into the kingdom. We can come in, slide in. We can come in with a minimal commitment mentality and God will still let us in the kingdom. But does he want more? Would he desire more? Would, does he want us to put it first? See, people do this in all the areas of their life. Minimal commitment living. Minimum commitment to their job. Minimal commitment to their kids. Minimal commitment to their marriage. Minimal commitment to anything and everything. And they think they're getting away with a better life. But that's not life. Kingdom living is not minimal commitment. It's all in. Full commitment. In order for us to receive the benefit and the blessing and that we are a light on a hill and we stand out and we become a difference because kingdom is everything. There's nothing else that compares. That's what these parables remind me of. Because of the high cost of the kingdom, it is an acquired taste. Isn't it? Most people do not want to give up everything to be active in the kingdom and congregation. And I'm most people. We've still got a good life. There's lots of freedoms that we have. There's lots of other choices that we can make, even in our family. And our time is paid for by this congregation. But he wants us to acquire a taste for it. It can take a while to desire being a part of God's work in the world and over top of our own interests. See, growing up, we gave up camping on weekends. When we started coming to church, we went from not going to church ever to going to church all the time. Anytime the doors were open. And a part of that was we gave up camping on the weekends, sold our trailer to donate so the church could buy a building because nothing else got in the way of connecting with the church. Our parents showed us that commitment. Did we agree with it? It didn't matter. <laughs> we weren't a part of that discussion. This is what we're doing. Faith is all in faith. Here's another thing we need to learn about faith. Saying yes means saying no. If you say yes to being a part of the congregation and commitment to services, you say no to everything else that comes up at that time. True? If you say yes to things that conflict, you've now said no to meeting with the church. So be careful what you say yes to because it means saying no to everything else. The two don't usually overlap. Nothing got in the way of connecting with the church and that's the way that shaped us all into ministry. Rick's family, our family, Penny's family, it showed us kingdom first living and we've all tried to live that way. Knowing the cost of the, and the value of the kingdom is a part of spiritual maturity and it is often learned by seeing others put Jesus first. It's very likely that people are watching your life as they consider the cost and the value of the kingdom. They want to know, is your commitment to the church, the kingdom, and the church, what does that look like? What does this cost you and what's the value? But we learn that by example. The last two passages, the one that Rick just used, Matthew 7, 13, and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. This truth helps us acquire thirst for the kingdom because it reminds us that we're on the unpopular path. And sometimes we need that reminder. We need that reminder of why isn't everybody with us? Am I doing this alone? But you know what happens when you walk on the narrow path? You get awful close to one another, don't you? There's no room for error. There's no room for straying away. You're on the narrow path. And so you're on that narrow path with the others that are on that narrow path. And you do get to know each other pretty well. You might not know a lot of people, but you can know them well. Kingdom living puts us at, odd with, at odds with the world and its selfishness and its short-sightedness. 
we live in a world that's kind of like this. See, I brought my binoculars. How are they supposed to be used? Like that? <laughs> Kingdom living is looking like this. See, at this, I can read everything that's on the backboard, including the small print. But if I turn it this way, I can see what's on the screen. I can't even read what's on the page. Kingdom and living is us looking for the long term, knowing that the rest of the world is living this way. This is so short-sighted, isn't it? It's viewing the world the wrong way. It's a totally different perspective. People in the world only see what's right in front of them. Right? That's what they focus on. What's happening right now? What's in the moment? Changing the direction means it's going to take a while to adjust. If you've lived your life looking through this side, and somebody says, hey, turn that around, is life going to seem different? You know what you miss when you turn it this way? Try looking down. Everything right in front of you is so blurry, you can't live that way. Like you, That's where the difficulty comes. Anything close to you becomes irrelevant. You're always looking to the future. You're always seeing what's in the distance. And you have to keep focus as you go that way. This adjusted vision is much more suited to looking in the distance. It can have trouble focusing on the here and the now. This is how Christians are to live. When we, are, when we call others to see things our way, we have to realize it's going to be tough for them to make the change. They've lived it the other way around for so long, it's not going to be natural for them to look at it for the future, for the long term. But here's a couple things. It's extra difficult when they see people who call themselves Christians turning it around and looking with the same backwards direction. If you say, hey, don't look at life that way. Look at it this way. But they look at you and you're looking at it exactly the same way. You say, well, why do I have to make the change? If we're going to call pe people to kingdom living, we have to keep kingdom focused. Another challenge to people acquiring or thirst for the kingdom and living this way can be when the church says, you know, you don't really need to change your view. The way you see the world, the way you interact with it, it's fine. There's enough grace to cover everything. When we don't actually call people to change their vision, we need to teach the cost and the benefit of the kingdom living as well as the need to change focus, knowing that only a few will want to follow because it's the harder way of living. But forewarned is forearmed. So we need not be surprised when it is only the few. Because what we're calling people to is a big change. Kingdom living is an all-in living. Kingdom living is counter-cultural. Kingdom living is for the narrow path, not the broad. But it is the much better life. Because in the end, well done, good and faithful servant. Another passage that I want to remind us of, familiar passage, occurs in the Sermon on the Mount. It is at the end of the section about worry. Just after Jesus says that the world worries about what to eat, what to drink, what to wear, he reminds us that God knows that we need these things in contrast to the way of the world, as those that have acquired a thirst for the kingdom, he says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And often we may focus on the, oh, and everything's given to us as well. But there's two important words at the beginning, the seek and first. So I was doing some more checking into these words. The word seek is the tail, properly to seek by inquiring, to seek by investigating, to reach a binding, a terminal, a final resolution, to search, getting to the bottom of the matter. 
It's not a haphazard look around. It means to investigate and then commit to that truth. If this is true, then this is how it impacts me. I have done my seeking, and here's the conclusion. The conclusion means this. Not I'm exploring my options. It is investigate and conclude. Because this life is short and eternal life is long. Because we would rather serve God than be tormented by Satan. We are convinced that we want to be people of the kingdom. This is what we have sought after. And this is the answer that we have found. You have to take ownership of your own faith. You seek it. You conclude. You decide. He says to seek first. The word first, proton, like a prototype, the very first. According to Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, it's the neuter of protos. It's an adverb, firstly. Firstly in time and place, in order and importance. You seek before. You seek at the beginning. You seek chiefly or primarily. You seek first of all. You see how this is impactful to the passage? It's not occasionally, haphazardly stumble across. Sometimes you think of the kingdom. It is you're convinced that kingdom living is relevant, important, and sets the direction of your life, and you put it first, chiefly. It is the prototype of everything. It directs every decision that we make. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. When we live that way, God doesn't leave us out of the rest. He still provides us food, clothing, shelter. He still provides us with family, friends. He still provides us with all of the other things. But he calls us to kingdom living firstly. These are two very small parables with very large impact. Many people who call themselves Christians want the benefit of the kingdom without putting the king and the kingdom first. The call of, of Christ and the work of the church should be the primary factor in any and every decision making because that is part of what it means to seek the kingdom first. Now, I almost put every major decision making, but that gives us a loophole. Every decision we make, some of them are completely morally neutral. But every decision should be filtered through this. How does this help or hinder the work of the church and our congregation? If I take this job, how does it help or hinder the work of the church of this congregation? If I spend this money, how does it help or hinder the work of this of the church? How does this impact kingdom living? If I make this decision, how does it hinder kingdom living? How does it help it? What benefits the kingdom? What goes against it? What's no completely neutral? It can be hard to get used to this, but it becomes an acquired taste. It becomes second nature to filter all your decisions through how does this benefit the kingdom. It means that other tastes that were enjoyed now become unappealing by comparison. Because we just know. That doesn't really help the kingdom, so I'm not involved with that. This decision-making process simplifies life and allows us to invest in the kingdom for the future. Refusing to do so, God gives you that option. Partially doing so, God gives us that option as well. But he wants the best for us. He wants us to seek first, to put kingdom above everything. So the application today is, is very much a personal one. You have to decide what this looks like. Each person in each family needs to decide how to apply today's message. It's not for any of us to reach into anybody else's life and say that's why you need to or that's why you should or that's maybe with encouragement. I like how you. But allow each person to make that decision. How are they going to do this? Kingdom living involves the work of the local congregation, so we need to decide how to put Jesus first as we connect to each other. 
to say, I'm going to be a part of the kingdom. I want to be in God's kingdom first, but I don't want much to do with the congregation. That doesn't work. The two are related. We need to value what God has provided in calling us together and give us meaningful work to do together. We work better together. The work can be done with more. And God has said, bring them together. We need to share the call to the world around us and give people the time to acquire a taste for kingdom living. We have to realize that in Canada, with most people, it takes about five years of investment before there's a Bible study. You might know a person for a long time before they get to the point of saying, so where do you go? I know you believe, why? So you get to those bigger questions. It can take a long time because... You're asking them to make a lot of changes. We need to thank Jesus for the changes that he makes in our lives and his patience. Amen. His patience with us as we serve him. As we serve him individually, as we serve him as a congregation, as we know that we should put him first, but we put him maybe first and a half, not quite second, or co-equal. He's patient with us, saying, okay, I'll take that. I'll work from there. So this week, evaluate your work in the kingdom and in the congregation. And particularly, because we're coming to the end of our sermon series, make plans to put Christ first as we make our congregational plans in the fall. Think of the decisions now and they're, how they're going to impact what we do as a congregation from the fall. It's difficult for me to write this without it being finger-wagging. But it is also very encouraging because we, we need to thank one another. I need to thank the congregation. Thank you for your thirst for the kingdom and the ability to work together serving Christ, congregation, and community for God's glory and the growth of the kingdom. See, what we can do is we can do more together. And there's always more to give, isn't there? There's always that little bit more where we know we could give back to God, where it could be just that more important. But we also need to be thanking one another for what you are offering, for what we offer one another, how we do support and encourage. Thank you for sharing the load. Thank you for the focus that we have. And let's just continue to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, that we would put everything else away so that God would receive the glory. Next week we finish all of this with a, a summary about, well, why even do these things? Why do the thirsty bottles? Why do a thirsty sermon series? I'm going to try to share what my input, what my point was in developing this. Because over the next number of months, all the sermons somehow are going to relate to kingdom starting with the series about song number 1014.